And on behalf of CSIS, I want to welcome you to this event. Our CEO, John Hamry, is on the road today, so um, I'm substituting uh, for him, which I am thrilled to be doing for my colleague, Mike Green, but let me just assure you that we're Dr. Hamry in town. He would have wanted to be here personally. Um, before we get any further, I do want to just give you a quick safety announcement. Uh, we feel very safe in this building, but should a fire alarm or something like that go off, your designated safety official who's uh, fulfilling many roles today sure. is Dr. Mike Green. So um, he will signal you to go out the front the way you came in uh, or out the back. There's doors behind us. Um, we, are, we make sure our scholars are, are full, fully employed at all moments of the day. So uh, he, he will be doing that for you. Um, it's my privilege to be introducing the speakers that we have here today for the launch of more than Providence Grand Strategy in American Power in the Asia Pacific since 1783 by Dr. Michael J. Green. First, Mike Green himself. Mike is the Senior Vice President for Asia and Japan Chair here at CSIS. He is also the Chair in Modern and Contemporary Japanese Politics and Foreign Policy at Georgetown University. He served on the staff of the National Security Council from 2001 through 2005, first as Director for Asian Affairs with responsibility for Japan, Korea, Australia, and New Zealand, and then as Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asia with responsibility for East Asia and South Asia. Mike and I have collaborated several times on a series of studies relating in particular to U.S. defense strategy in Asia Pacific, including a report on Asia Pacific Rebalance published last year in a soon to be released report on countering Chinese maritime coercion. By more than Providence is one of the most comprehensive historical studies of U.S. strategy in Asia, and it's an incredibly important contribution to the field. I think it makes clear, and I think today's event will demonstrate this, that the United States has had a long and abiding strategic interest in Asia, and that's an interest that should endure. It's an essential read for policymakers searching for a broader context regarding modern American policies and approach in this region. And if the conversation in the green room prior to the event is any hint, um, I think you're going to enjoy the dialogue that you hear here today. Joining Mike on stage will be Kurt Campbell, Robert Zellick, and James Rosen. Kurt is the chairman and CEO of the Asia Group and serves as chairman of the Center for New American Security. From 2009 to 2013, Kurt served as the Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, where he is widely thought of as the key architect of the pivot to Asia. He uh, also used to have a job here at CSIS that sounded remarkably like my job, um, so I guess there's hope for me yet. Robert Zellig is a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Prior to joining Harvard, he served as the U.S. Trade Representative from 2001 to 2005, the Deputy Secretary of State from 2005 to 2006, and the 11th President of the World Bank Group from 2007 to 2012. Our moderator today is James Rosen, who is the chief Washington correspondent for Fox News, and I'm going to turn it over to James. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hicks, and thank you all for being with us, and congratulations to Mike on the publication of this extraordinary work, and Mike's family is here with him, and a lot of good friends, and we welcome you all uh, to what we hope will be a very informative discussion of the history of U.S. strategy toward Asia, uh, and of course the current moment as well. Uh, Mike, this is a truly monumental study. Uh, congratulations on it. it. It reflects your work inside American government at the highest levels, but also deep archival research, uh, original interviews that you conducted, and a survey of the existing literature on this subject, which found remarkably that there has not been published uh, a single volume comprehensive study of U.S. Uh, strategy toward Asia as a whole since 1922. Um, you undertook this effort despite uh, the skepticism that exists in some academic circles uh, as to whether the United States ever does grand strategy at all with respect to any region. Uh, tell us, in essence, what you found after all of this study, your conclusions about U.S. strategy uh, towards Asia since our founding, uh, and the common themes, or as you put it, tensions uh, that all presidents and secretaries of state have confronted across this very long span of time. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, James and, and Bob and Kurt, two of the people, frankly, who've had uh, more influence on my thinking about this topic than anyone. And thank you all. Um, 
I worked for Curtin the Pentagon back in the day um, and helped write, among other things, the East Asia Strategic Report. I then worked in the um, George W. Bush NSC for almost five years, writing different variations of what we called strategery, um, uh, presidential directives, speeches, national security strategy. So I did a lot of strategy. And when I left the NSC, I you know, came out asking myself, that was all great, but where did it all come from? Um, we assert certain things about our interests in trade or in forward presence or alliances. And I decided it would be useful to teach about that and also to write about it. Um, I, I quickly found uh, uh, two things that made this a much bigger task than I thought. Um, the first was that um, uh, American strategic culture is not one that lends itself to Thucydides or Metternich. We're a democracy with a divided uh, government by design. The Founding Fathers didn't want the commander to be able to um, order the entire US government what to do. So you had to look at strategic concepts, not just as concepts, you had to look at what happened to them in practice. It's a much messier process. And so um, it wasn't just enough to write a, a kind of breezy intellectual history of ideas. I had to show what happened to them in practice, which survived, how they came out again, how agency collided with structure, how concepts collided with reality, to really get the evolution of what we um, do uh, in Asia. And the second was most, I was certainly taught, most people are taught that our strategic thinking about Asia began in 1945 or maybe 1950 or so. Which is where a lot of the books tend to start. Where they tend to start. And I thought I'd write a short chapter about the sort of 19th century. Well, it's rich. The seeds of the thinking about Asia are, are, are go way back. So I started the book um, in 1783 because that's the year that Thomas Jefferson, with the American Revolution still underway, wrote to Colonel George Rogers Clark on the frontier warning that the British were sending an expedition across Canada to control the Pacific Northwest. He obviously wanted a republic from coast to coast, but he also knew about trade with Canton. He knew about the Sandwich Islands and trade of sandalwood and about seal otter pelts caught in the Pacific Northwest. And he knew about them from a sort of um, wild uh, Dartmouth grad named John Ledyard who had dropped out, joined the Royal Marines, sailed around the Pacific on Captain Cook's flagship, and then during the revolution, uh, you know, fled and joined the revolution and told the founding fathers, many of them, about this vast Pacific and all the potential. And so the leitmotif of the book, again and again, um, and it starts with Thomas Jefferson's letter in 1783, is that the United States, at the end of the day, uh, will not abide another hegemonic power trying to keep us out of the Pacific and out of Asia. It began with the British in the Pacific Northwest um, in 1823, uh, uh, at the time of the Monroe Doctrine, John Quincy Adams told the Russians we were prepared to go to war to stop them from expanding into what's today Oregon. We, by the way, had no navy and no ability to get there to fight them. But Adams understood the European balance of power and he played it. Um, in 1841, uh, John Tyler announced the Tyler Doctrine, expanding it to Hawaii. And essentially, well before the balance of power strategies in the Pacific we saw in the Cold War era, prominent American thinkers, Mahan, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, were thinking about how we use balance of power to our advantage to keep the Pacific open. Um, but of course, we're Americans, so it's never that clean. It's never that um, straightforward. And uh, as Winston Churchill or someone said, you can always count on the Americans to do all the wrong thing before they do the right thing. So even though the aggregate history is quite um, positive in terms of the American ability to use balance of power to our favor, we, we come across these constant uh, problems. And very briefly, the first is that we are fundamentally a transatlantic power. Um, and most of our Asia strategy, whether it was FDR's decision in World War II to start with the defeat of Germany first, even though Japan had attacked us, or the Vietnam War, which began uh, in the 50s with the European Bureau of the State Department controlling the policy, because it was a French colony. And then we escalated and stayed in the war because we were worried about how it would look to the Soviets in Europe. So, so much of our Asia policy is shaped by Europe or other regions. Um, Americans today, over half of Americans say Asia is the most important region, but that's been a drag on our strategy. Um, we look at Asia across a vast Pacific Ocean. Civilization in Asia centers on China and always has, but we're a maritime power. 
concerned about the Pacific, and the first place we come to of consequence is Japan. And this goes way back. In 1853, um, the US ambassador called a commissioner in China wanted to take the small American Far Eastern squadron um, up the Pearl River to show the flag and to make the case that America had an interest in China not being carved up by the imperial powers. He sort of anticipated John Hay's open door note. And um, at the same time, the commander of that small fleet, a man named Commodore Matthew Perry, had orders from the president that he had written himself to take the fleet, get out of China, and open up Japan. And Perry came back after that expedition and argued our future is with Japan, a maritime nation more likely to align with our view of the world. But others argued China. So this tension between Japan and China is still with us. Um, we've continued to struggle, and to this day, with the question of what our defensive line is, what, how far do our interests go? Uh, Thomas Jefferson said the Pacific Northwest, but he had broader visions. Uh, Tyler said Hawaii. Many naval officers wanted coaling stations, and in 1898, we got them. We defeated Spain, and we scooped up Hawaii, Guam, um, the Philippines, and the Navy came to President Theodore Roosevelt and said, boss, we have a problem. We have to defend these forward outposts across thousands of nautical miles where the Japanese are right there. And that began this long process of our planning, how we would fight Japan, called War Plan Orange. Uh, after the war, uh, George Cannon, uh, MacArthur, um, Marshall said, our defensive line is not on the continent. Our defensive line is to protect Japan, Philippines, Taiwan, this archipelago, this first island chain. So Atchison very famously wrote a line in 1950 in January saying, this is our defensive line. The Korean Peninsula is on the other side. Who noticed? The Kim Il-sung and the Chinese and the Russians. <laughs> they attacked North Korea. Truman did a great big, never mind, and then our defensive line was on the Korean Peninsula to stop communism, and then you know what happened next. The defensive line pulled on to the continent in Southeast Asia. Um, and then we pulled back. And so we, this Vietnam. is a constant struggle with the Vietnam War. Um, and today we're debating how hard do we draw the line in the South China Sea, where China's building military airfields. Um, on trade, uh, we've had a problem. The earliest American uh, exposure and, 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 uh, and engagement was trade. The Empress of China, on the cover of the book, set sail from New York in 1784 to start raising money to pay off the debt from the revolution. They brought ginseng from what's today West Virginia to Canton, made a 400% profit. But for 100 plus years, we traded in an effort to open markets, but we were protectionist uh, because the British were uh, our competitors. And in the 1880s, the great naval strategist Alfred Thayer Mahan said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Protectionism is like ironclads in the Civil War. It's good for defense, but if you want to be a major power, you have to have free trade which he said is like battle cruisers. And so the debate began, and it wasn't really until after the war with the Bretton Woods system that we created an open trading system that kept our market open, open markets, and linked us all. But of course, the consequence of that is intended that Japan, Korea, eventually China, rose up, and then we had trade friction, and you see it today with the debate over the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And finally, um, human rights and democracy. So, Strategists often argue that strategy is real politique, that democracy, human rights, is sort of extracurricular or emotional or sentimental or idealistic. It's very much a post-war, post-Wilsonian backlash by realists. But Thomas Jefferson, when he was looking at the Pacific Northwest, said, we don't do colonies. We just fought for our independence. What we should want is well-governed republics like ourselves. If they're well-governed, they won't be vulnerable to European imperialism. And if they're republics, they'll be aligned with us. Um, so from that point on, support for democratic institutions has been not only important, but successful. Because Asia is not Europe. Asia at this period was going through the collapse of empires, the rise of nation states, how you define the nation state. What kind of nation state is very much part of the battle of ideas in Asia, and we bring something to it. But again, um, and Kurt had to deal with this with Burma. Um, are we opening up Burma to improve its good governance and its democracy, or are we trying to support Burma so that it's not coming under China's orbit? There's a constant tension there as well. So we, we I mean, one of the things that came out in this book was from the beginning, because of geography, because of our value system, because of the nature of um, Asian civilizations, 
um, we've been successful, but we keep tripping over the same problems again and again, and it's kind of useful to know what those are before you make strategy. Right, and so there were five of these historic tensions uh, that span two centuries, two, more than two centuries of U.S. Uh, engagement uh, with Asia. Uh, Bob, given uh, your many roles over the years as a Deputy Secretary of State, a U.S. Trade Representative, you, you come at this from many different angles. Um, did, and particularly, of course, the question of whether America does grand strategy anymore. Uh, your thoughts on, on having read the book and, and, and Mike's presentation. Okay. Well, first, it's a great book. So I really commend it uh, to you all. And I want to thank Mike because, uh, as some of you know, in the university world now, diplomatic history is one of those subjects that isn't taught much anymore. And I'm actually very hopeful that this book actually gets people focused on it again. And uh, from a policymaker's perspective, as C CSIS is associated with, I've always found that having some historical grounding is a great foundation for understanding policy. And I think if you read the book, you'll have that sense too along with the point that Mike made, which there's a lot of interesting seeds of policy even for today that are planted in the 19th century. A lot of interesting ideas. Now on the grand strategy topic, um, I was very much uh, curious when I started the book to see how uh, Mike would, or would work with this idea because um, this is a topic that actually, if you look at the literature, has increased exponentially since the end of the Cold War. Uh, when I was studying diplomatic history, people actually, they talked about strategy and Clausewitz, but we didn't really talk about uh, grand strategy. And uh, Very briefly, what's that distinction? Well, the, the key, the, the strategy is traditionally focused on military. And, uh, and the grand strategy comes through various definitions, but it tends to be all instruments of power, it tends to be uh, longer term, and it tends to have the notion of some goals that are related to the longer term. But your, your question actually goes to the core point, which is that there's a debate about, you know, does this thing exist and can the U.S. do it? And uh, this book is a good uh, way of addressing that. There's a, a young Australian scholar named Nina Solove, who Mike's helped, uh, who actually has an article that I'll come into you, going to come out in security studies, that asks about what does grand strategy really mean? And she kind of frames it as there's three different ideas. One is plans, you know, so the idea that you'd actually be able to articulate directions. Another is principles. Another is patterns of behavior. And in a sense, what Mike has done is he's looked at the patterns of behavior, and with his five points, he's kind of nudging it towards a sense of, of, uh, of principles. So I think he's done an excellent job of this. But the third and final point I'd like to make is that particularly Many people that come to foreign policy from a political security background, as Mike did, um, either they skip the economics <laughs> or they basically kind of tag it on. And Mike has done a very good job here of trying to integrate economics into the overall security discussion and not just see it as in conflict, but as he started to talk about, to see how it's mutually reinforcing, how it's a notion of national power, but also how it's a notion of values and governance, which is very important in the United States. And another element that starts in the 19th century, the role of private sector actors. You know, many times people who look at the subjects look at states and governments, but to see the private sector is very important. And Mike has a nice little point here where he talks about Ronald Reagan's links among capitalism, liberty, uh, and military strategy. But also he makes a point uh, on the grand strategy where he notes out, I think it was Wynne Lord writing to Kissinger in 1970 that says, there really isn't a grand strategy. So one of the nice things about this is that I think uh, the, the notes are as interesting as the text because there's a lot of the debate about America in the world and the difference between the Chinese and Japanese perspectives. So I think he's done a real service, I hope, not only to scholarship but also to policymaking. In a lot of the best scholarly books, the action really takes place in the footnotes. I think we agree. <laughs> uh, Kurt, as, as Assistant Secretary of State under Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, were you in a position, you were certainly in a position to observe uh, U.S. Uh, engagement with the region, but I wonder if you had the ability to observe these, these, these uh, permeating tensions that, that Mike has discerned in, our, in the history of, of these engagements. Great. Uh, thank you, James, and uh, great to be on the panel with such good friends, and congratulations to Mike on a tremendous book. I read the first draft of this almost... Um, 100. About 10 years ago, actually. So, this is, no, no, that's not a joke, actually. That's the truth. 
Uh, this is not something that was written uh, overnight. Um, Mike labored on it for years. And um, the uh, trajectory from the outset when he first started working on this is remarkable. And what I commend him for is I think he, you know, a lot of uh, scholarship in Washington is what we call objective analysis. I'll give you the objective, you give me the analysis. Sort of kind of, <laughs> I'm gonna prove to you from the outset what I think. And um, from the earliest um, contributions that Mike started to work on, it was clear that his thinking evolved generally. And James, to your direct questions, the, the tensions are immediately apparent within government and we've all experienced them. And what's fascinating about them is we are, we are, uh, we are commonly used to the primary tensions um, in government that we're most aware of, most familiar with, to be really between Democrats and Republicans. But in fact, Asia policy is the place in which the real tensions, fundamentally, that are not always acknowledged, exist within the parties, right? And the uh, most difficult subjects and the ones that Mike really illuminates are often played out bureaucratically inside government. So not only does he describe in really majestic terms the history of uh, the US engagement in Asia, but he also helps us understand how Asia was uh, the policy itself was conducted within government, which in itself is fascinating. The British tradition bureaucratically and dividing lines, how the military undertook certain uh, 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 examples of engagement that were different than the Secretary of State and such. So for me, um, I found that most helpful. Like, I couldn't sometimes figure out why I'll just give you one example, why one bureau that I worked with in the State Department, why we hate each other, just, it was like our ancestors had fought in caves. And, and I couldn't figure it out, and I didn't understand it until I read Mike's book and realized that the, 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 the seeds of this dated back decades, 100 years, right? It wasn't something that simply came into being when we were um, uh, confirmed in the, you know, a couple of weeks before, uh, you, know, you know, settling into power. I will say, what, what, what's interesting about how to interpret this book. So James, when, when Mike started, he described this letter, right? Which is a wonderful way to begin the book. So when I read the letter, so Mike's depiction of the letter is, aha, this makes very clear, very clear, that the, that the one line that runs through American policy is the determination to stop uh, the domination of Asia uh, by any other party, right? I, I read the letter and I see something quite different. I see that like historically throughout the history, American policy is animated by incomplete information, <laughs> uh, mythology, uh, a tremendous sense of mystery and untold riches that are just right across the horizon if we could just figure out how to get there, right? And it is that issue those sets of uh, sort of competing lack of information the like that I think are more important when understanding the history of uh, American policy towards Asia. So I, I do believe there is a uh, concept, as Bob indicates, of sort of uh, strategy or overarching grand strategy or competing grand strategies. But I also think that the animating feature is a general layer of incompetence, mystery, and intrigue, and hope that has animated across decades yeah. of American policy in Asia. Yeah, there's no shortage of incompetence and bureaucratic intrigue, to be sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's in the index, if you'd like to go straight to those parts. Incompetence, yeah. pages yeah. one Comma. to 700. Right? Um, you know, there's a famous book called The Structure of Scientific Paradigms that was published in 1962. You probably all read it in college. And where people like to think of the ascent of our scientific knowledge as just a single upwardly sloping straight line, in fact, the progress of science has been marked by human pettiness and, and, and territorial issues and so forth. Uh, and so we shouldn't be surprised that U.S. policy toward Asia has, has succumbed to some of that. But Kurt, before I let you go, as a practitioner, um, Mike just talked about how uh, he traced uh, over these two centuries a recurring issue wherein policymakers have sought to uh, draw the defensive line 
in Asia for the United States? Where do we determine, in essence, that something's worth fighting for, right? Mm -hmm. And that line has shifted, as Mike mentioned. Where, uh, from your vantage point, did you see Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton drawing that line? Well, they're, uh, uh, they're actually quite different in terms of how they would you know, make their own determinations about this. And I'd, I'm probably a little bit reluctant to go into this, but I would say, I would say there, there, there is, there was hardly a fight that Secretary Clinton wasn't interested in getting involved in. So she, <laughs> she, she, she would be very comfortable with the ramparts being fairly uh, further uh, extended, and she believed quite vehemently that we had helped establish this operating system in Asia which she felt was quite good for every country, in fact, probably better for China in some respects than even the United States, and that efforts to undermine territorial integrity or uh, peaceful resolution of disputes or the sanctity of contracts had to be pursued uh, aggressively and assertively. Um, and I think, uh, I, I think in, in many of our interactions that became clear. I think probably President Obama uh, I, I, my guess, and I didn't have as much interaction with him, I think he tended to take the longer view, particularly with re regard to engagements um, with China, and felt that there were areas that you could push very hard on uh, that were essential for um, the effective operation of, uh, of Asia and U.S. policy within it, and there are other issues that I think he tended to understand were central to how uh, China conceived of its role in the Asia Pacific region. And you find it playing out again and again and again. So an attempt, for instance, to draw a, uh, a, a defense perimeter through the South China Sea. Not only will you come immediately in uh, uh, stark realization how difficult that will be to back up militarily, <laughs> but at the same time, it's hard to figure out what exactly are you uh, preserving here. Are you suggesting that, that no territorial issue should be resolved through force? Are you saying that, that there has to be peaceful means? If so, how? Yeah, what is a defensive line, in yeah, short? Yeah, yeah. so I, 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 and I, I would say at it, James, fundamentally, um, one of the things that I think we have seen over the last several years, beginning in Mike and Bob's administration, continuing with ours, and I think even now, is um, only an episodic engagement in Asia. And that is the other issue that you find that runs historically through um, Mike's book and almost all treatments, is for those of us who are always focused on Asia, we feel you know, acutely that other regions, other issues get more attention and more focus. And so, you know, if you listen to Chinese interlocutors, you know, they had spent all this time getting ready for this initial summit with uh, President Trump, you know, kind of decisive event, only to find that most of the interlocutors had been spending the last week and a half figuring out, you know, which exact craters to make on this particular runway in Syria. And it is, it is that set of issues, and I'm not making fun of this administration, that is exactly the same in the, in the Obama administration and exactly the same in the Bush administration. I hate to break it to you, Kurt, but your comments did just show up on the wires. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Mike, as a kind of, uh, as very quickly before I move to our next question with you, I would like it if you would explain the title uh, to the audience by more than providence. How, how did you select it and what does it mean? Um, I selected it over beers in the uh, Imperial Hotel in Tokyo with my friend Michael Hanlon, who's really pissed that I didn't give him credit for that in the forward. So Mike, if you're out there somewhere watching, thanks. <laughs> um, uh, you know, B Bismarck had a quote that Americans have special providence, that we're basically lucky. Um, the great historian um, uh, Walter Russell Mead titled his book by special providence when he tried to characterize the different schools of broad American thinking about the world. <clears throat> and what I was trying to argue is um, that our position in Asia, which is strong and uh, is enviable um, and was built over centuries, was not just a matter of providence. We didn't inherit this by the goodwill of, of God or nature. It took thought. And yes, 
thought that had to overcome incredible levels of incompetence and bureaucratic <laughs> infighting, which is what diplomatic historians often find themselves drawn into. When you look at decision making, in, when you write a whole book about their entry into Vietnam, for example, the, the incompetence just rises to the top, or when you're in government, you see it every day. If you step back a little bit and look at the arc of history, you start to see patterns that make you feel a little less anxious about our ability as Americans to manage our affairs in the world. <laughs> um, as Kurt notes uh, indirectly, we are blessed, I think, to convene with you uh, just immediately following this first summit between President Trump and the Chinese President Xi Jinping. As we all know, the Chinese prefer their summits tightly scripted, uh, and so they approached uh, this one, I think, with some degree of apprehension about the mercurial character that they were going to be uh, encountering, and then on top of that, only to find him ordering uh, airstrikes in the Middle East uh, while the president was on American soil. Um, if you, uh, with, with mindful that there's so much we don't know yet about the Trump presidency, including the names of the people who will serve as the chief officers on Asia policy at the Department of State or the Department of Defense and what have you, uh, and other key agencies, mindful of all that, uh, let's look to the future briefly here. Uh, so that we might uh, illuminate more this present moment. Uh, if, if a new edition of By More Than Providence were to be published 10 years from now, um, how might we see uh, the Trump presidency being incorporated into this extraordinary vision of the 200 years that you've put forward? Or am I making a, an, un, an unsubstantiated assumption that he will fit into that history? I'm tempted to say the answer is I'll have to change the title to by much, much, much more than Providence. <laughs> um, <laughs> by, but, unbelievable providence. <laughs> by unbelievable <laughs> Providence. Um, uh, I, I don't think the Trump administration's Asia policy will look the same in, in a year. It may not look the same in three minutes. Um, and it's not the first time, by the way, that presidents have come in running against Washington with certain theories about how the region works, about where our leverage lies. Um, Bill Clinton was somewhat in that mode. Um, he had certain ideas about conditioning human rights uh, with trade in a very mechanical way with China, uh, demanding market share of Japan based on theories that didn't survive in practice. One thing Bill Clinton had famously was um, what people call contextual, and Joe Nye calls, uh, of Harvard calls contextual intelligence. He knew when things weren't working and he adjusted and, and, and with Kurt's help, frankly, uh, and Joe Nye's and others produce a pretty good set of Asia policies out of what had been a rather chaotic start. Um, I think um, the Trump administration came into office probably not expecting to be in office with very, very different views about trade in particular, um, with certain theories about uh, America's role in the world. Um, one thing I'm certain of is they did not come into office backed by an American public that wanted us to retreat from Asia. You know, over half of Americans say Asia is the most important region. Over half of Americans support uh, in the elections before the poll, uh, polls before the election, over half of Americans support the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Free Trade. Support for our alliance is the highest it's been. When Americans are asked, should we defend Japan or Korea if they're attacked? Very high numbers. There's no groundswell of anti-engagement in Asia. Even That's as not it where this comes from. Even as it coexists with a mindset of America first? Right, so that's right. Well, America first, but not I'm America to, alone, right? I'm tempted to go all historian on you, but um, <laughs> Please. the America first tradition was an anti-Europe tradition. Uh, Americans have always been much more open to engagement with the Pacific. Uh, in 1940, I cite a poll from Gallup after France fell to the Nazis. In 1940, two-thirds of Americans still said stay out of the war in Europe, but about two-thirds said we should pressure Japan, even if it risks war. So Asia's a bit different, but the bottom line is, is, is this. Um, in a way, this is a book about agency, the ideas people have, the things they try to do, and structure, um, the reality of power and institutions. Mm -hmm. Domestically, I think the structure of American institutions and American public opinion are still quite robust in terms of engagement in Asia. And in the region, you simply can't have a successful policy to manage the rise of China, which they say they want to do, if you're fighting with Japan. So you've got to have Japan if you're going to get China right, and you're going to have to get China if you're going to get North Korea right. So all of the pressures they're under, I think, are going to push them, as we've already begun to see, in directions that uh, approximate the traditions we've had. 
Um, now, when I've said this in the past, one academic fr friend said, oh great, so the swamp wins again. Um, it will be different, but I do think that the, the domestic institutions and interests of the American people and the pressures um, on our interests in the region are going to discipline this administration as it has, as they have, uh, previous administrations that came in with a, you know, an anti-establishment view. Uh, Bob, our earliest engagement uh, with Asia as a region was really driven by economics, right? by the desire to expand commerce. Um, and of course, security always plays a role, our, our, our desire to make sure that uh, we have unfettered uh, access to the seas and so on. But uh, the Asia Development Bank has forecast, for example, that by the middle of this century, um, uh, that region will account for 50% of the economic output around the world, and that four countries, China, India, uh, Indonesia, and Japan, uh, will rank among the top 10 largest economies. And yet, here we had an election in which the two major party nominees uh, both uh, renounced the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, Mike's book makes clear the, the essential role of trade uh, in U.S. grand strategy toward Asia for all of these centuries. Does the fact that we had this kind of election season with this renunciation of TPP uh, augur some diminution in the role of trade in our grand strategy toward this region? Well, uh, if you start by talking to people in Asia, economics is the coin of the realm. Um, if you think about the tremendous development that you just described, reduction of poverty, engagement in, in commodities, manufacturing, and others, this is the lifeblood of an Asia-Pacific economy. And as you properly mentioned, and as Mike talks about, we now need to see it really as a Pacific Indian economy, because it's, I, I think that's going to be a key component economically as well as strategically. So frankly, people in the region scratch their heads about <laughs> the walking away from TPP because from their point of view, TPP took six free trade agreements we already had and modernized them and added five other countries, the most significant of which uh, was Japan, a very important player in terms of Japan's own economic reforms and set a series of rules and approaches that frankly would have been a magnet for others. Uh, we already have a free trade agreement with South Korea, but they probably would have wanted to come in. There's others in Southeast Asia. And indeed, you even have people in China that were talking about, well, the practices they could use as part of the reform process. So to connect it to the book, I mean, I think, you know, what one of the benefits that Mike has done here, whether for the Trump administration or others, is we tend to look at these in compartmentalized fashion. So there's, you know, TPP and trade, or there's uh, South China Sea and security issues, or there's Japan and China. I mean, when I was thinking about your question to Kurt, I mean, I think the starting point where this book is a big help is to say, look, the United States is a maritime power. You have to understand the United States' approaches. And the Pacific, by the way, is very big. <laughs> and so if you're going to actually operate on the western side of the Pacific, you have to have certain position. Second point, which he also touches on, is that if you're going to think about dealing with an issue such as China today, you start with your allies. You start with the maritime partners. And then I think what historically, going back to this defensive line, what we've also learned is there are places on the continent, Korea in particular, that are so critical to the security of those maritime posts. Hence, this led to the sort of the defense of Korea and the Korean War, because without it, you would have had a problem with the future security of Japan. And then you have to connect in the economics, which is more than just a, when you asked about the, uh, the recent summit, frankly, you know, this is perhaps to be expected, but I think the Trump administration has been trying to catch up. I mean, the one thing that's quite striking around the world, if you look, whether it's Syria or North Korea or anywhere else, is the, the loss of strategic initiative. We're reacting to everything. And frankly, the Chinese knew that, and the Chinese came, and they brought some potential goodies, and they said, look, you know, here's a 100-day plan, let's fill in some certain things. And I think what they've also captured, and this could be the biggest strategic weakness, is this focus on bilateral trade deficits. If there's any idea that drives the Trump administration with the Pacific, or with Germany, or with Mexico, it's bilateral trade deficits. 
Now, frankly, economists would tell you that's a mistaken way of trying to approach trade or the overall economy. But the Chinese have said, fine, you know, so we'll buy some more beef and maybe we'll sell a little bit less steel. By the way, today you see in the newspaper, steel prices are going up, not a shock. Um, and we'll, we'll add on a few other things. And what the administration, I think, is potentially missing is actually the fundamental nature of the reforms in China and how they could affect our interests positively or negatively, particularly higher value added, technology, and some of the macroeconomic issues that are going to present the types of problems over the next 10 years like you had in 2005 to 7. This is the question of as they switch to greater consumption and less savings, how will the international economic system adjust? Now, part of this is that, look, it's a new team. Uh, I think it's a little unfortunate. They tend to look at everything in the past as a failure. And so they're not going to learn from it. But, and, and whether you're Republicans or Democrats, it's good to at least know what people tried or how they tried to do for different things. They're not staffed up. Uh, uh, President Trump obviously reacts to the sort of the moment and kind of how he's positioned. And so the question that you asked, a very important one to Mike about the future, that, that's a very unanswered issue. I personally suspect that, that what you see is the habits and patterns of security will push people back to the alliance structure, particularly with the help of people like Secretary Mattis. I think the economic area is much more of a question mark. And it's partly because if they continue to focus on bilateral trade deficits, they're going to drive into a hole. James, can I try on that? By all just, means. Yeah, just so to this point, I mean, I, I think the fundamental um, observation of, of Mike and, and Bob's very diplomatically put is that the jury is really still out. But there, there are issues that, that, that have to give us some pause, frankly. And I think the, the, the Probably the one that is more concerning, if you look at the tweets and the general pattern that the president, before he was elected, not just as he ran, but for 15 or 20 years, is a, an abiding belief that the quote, quote, deal that the United States has in Asia is a very bad one. And it's not just the trade issues that Bob described, is that our allies don't pay enough and that we're, you know, bailing them out and that most of Asia has gotten rich on our uh, behalf. And so I think the fundamental framework that the president comes into thinking about Asia is that we've gotten rooked and we have a bad deal. And this is not just the previous administration, it is our entire approach. And that's hard to revisit. I think that is a framework that is difficult. That would be the first issue. The and second- And it's not only Asia, by the way. I mean, that's, that's North America no, or Mexico, understand. or it's uh, Europe. NATO. I, it's the heart of his philosophy. Yeah, I, I, the, the second is, what's interesting, if you, know, you, you talk to Chinese friends and other friends who've interacted, I have never seen an administration in which the ideological breadth is so great, frankly. Um, and it's hard, you know, when you tell people to sit down and get along, it's, you know, that, you know, you can be friendly to one another, but if you have such different worldviews, you have in this administration the most supportive of the U.S.-China relationship of any administration ever, ranging, you know, from we can build hotels together in the South China Sea, all the way, all the way to hegemons fight, let's get ready to fight, right? And let's do it sooner rather than later because later will be better, for, will be not as good for us. It's hard to have very dominant people that, that entertain a spectrum that's this large. And then the third issue is, you know, the hope is that there, there will be people that will read this book. Uh, you know, the president had a, an enormous amount of time with Prime Minister Abe. And I think one of the most hopeful things was in fact, a real sit down to talk about Asia and the world. And because the president tends to like either leaders or very rich men. Those are people no, that, that he'll take guidance and advice from. In 20 hours of conversations with, with Prime Minister Abe, he asked a lot of questions. Where was the Second World War fought in Asia? What, you know, what happened in Vietnam? And, and no, no, but guys, I mean, so the truth is, you can say, wow, you don't know that, that's crazy. But you can say the other thing, the fact that he's asking questions and trying to understand is going to be essential for us to be effective going forward. And so I think the problem with equating this with the beginnings of the Carter administration, uncertainties about troop levels in Korea or human rights and Clinton or, you know, 
butchers of Beijing, those are on the margins. The broad acceptance of the American tradition has been bipartisan for decades. This potentially is a dramatic departure, and there is a tendency from all of us to want to normalize and say this is a normal trajectory, but the, the level of needing to kind of pull back to equilibrium is going to be a very long distance. Mike, one uh, extraordinary event in the Trump presidency with respect to Asia uh, actually occurred even prior to his swearing in when he accepted this telephone call from the Taiwanese leader, right? Uh, which apparently had been partially uh, brokered through Bob Dole um, and his law firm, uh, which represented Taiwan. Um, and, and, and certainly that had to give the Chinese pause. Uh, but I just wonder if you would uh, speak to, um, having studied so much history here, uh, where you would see China drawing that defensive line with respect to Taiwan. Uh, we all might remember in uh, early 2001, before 9-11, when President George W. Bush was newly sworn in, he was asked off the cuff in a television interview uh, yeah. what he would do to defend Taiwan from any aggression by China, by mainland China. And he simply shot off the cuff, whatever it takes. And this sent ripples throughout the world. Um, where do you see China uh, viewing Taiwan where is their defensive line? Is this something you think they still have on their mind to do? Are they willing to do it militarily? What would be the conditions they would see as necessary to obtain for them to move like that? So on the Tsai Ing-wen call to the president, I actually thought that was a good thing. Um, I, I don't know where Curtin Bob are on it. Um, Taiwan's a democracy. They're our friend. Um, when you're president, you cannot easily speak with and there's no precedent since 79 for meeting with um, uh, the president of Taiwan. So um, demonstrating strong support early, I think, is a good thing. And in fact, um, historically, um, you know, Ronald Reagan uh, promised as a candidate to normalize relations again with Taiwan, you know, completely shocking the Chinese. And as you pointed out, um, our old boss, George W. Bush, said in the first few months that, you know, he would rise up to defend Taiwan, which sort of broke the Clinton administration's, you know, careful ambiguity about what we do. Um, you know, George W. Bush, Ronald Reagan, they had pretty productive relationships with China. I think there's something to be said for making your principles clear early on. Um, now, uh, if Taiwan and Japan and the rest of the region thinks you're doing it just to horse trade, which is what you'll often hear in Taipei, that, that Taiwan can be a bargaining chip, that does not work so well. I think the, the the administration is right to start making it very clear uh, that we're going to stay committed to our allies and so forth. But Mike, um, if I, but just on that, the, so I, I you know, I, I don't have any problem with the call either, but then if you subsequently say, you know, um, maybe I did it because I'll get a better deal with China. Right, right? that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, or, or today, I, you know, uh, we'll go easier with you on the trade issues if we can get North Korea right. I think the worry is right now that you know, that as there, these issues are being debated hotly in Asia, across the board, allies. And I think, the, I think what the conclusion folks are coming to is that this is a highly transactional presidency on the issues that Bob described. So if you can invest, maybe say, let's just choose states out of that out of a hat, maybe Pennsylvania, maybe Ohio, maybe Wisconsin, maybe Michigan, do a little thing there and be able to get a good tweet, maybe that's going to be enough to keep you out of the penalty box and be able to go about your business. And so it's, I think that's the challenge for us, is that what lessons, early lessons, are Asian interlocutors taking? That's right. And I think this is where unpredictability is not a good strategy because the you know, core of our strength and our leverage is our alliances and our partnership and our commitment on principles, whether it's free trade or democracy. And if being unpredictable means your allies and your adversaries think everything's up for negotiation, you have a major, major problem. You'll, you'll hemorrhage leverage. You're not going to get leverage. But I'm, I think the administration's figuring that out. Um, but Kurt's right. There's still enough of a doubt about that that you know, there's nervous bureaucrats up all night in Taipei, Tokyo, and Seoul trying to figure out exactly uh, what the bottom line is. But by way of making them slightly more nervous, uh, my question to you was about uh, how right. you interpret China's view yeah. of all this and, and how dear to them is this goal of, of reclaiming Taiwan and what right. would be the conditions under which they might uh, 
seek to do that by force, or is that is that a very remote prospect? So the the you know there's also debate among uh, China scholars about whether China has a grand strategy, and I happen to think they do. If you recognize that grand strategy is messy and inconsistent, um, and I think the the basic bottom line for China in terms of grand strategy emerging from Zhang Nanghai and the leadership is that Asia is a naturally Sino-centric order. It's a naturally hierarchical order. China has for millennia been at the top, and that time is coming again. Um, and China will um, accelerate that transition with economic agreements with American allies, um, and will um, seek to avoid direct confrontation with the US, but in very incremental ways expand uh, its influence, whether that's by building bridges and roads or sending, you know, fighters and destroyers in the South China Sea. And um, the near sea doctrine, the, the Chinese version of our maritime strategy, is basically to deny the U.S. military access within the first island chain, control it, and then over time deny access. So it's, it's kind of the Chinese version of the defensive line. But does the leadership have any idea where the line really is? I mean, they're going to judge how far they can push based on us, and very, very importantly, based on our friends and allies. And if, and if the Chinese side pushes a little too hard to try to weaken US alliances, for example, beating up on the Koreans for accepting an American missile defense system, THAAD, uh, they will find very often that, for example, in Korea, support for the alliances going up, support for THAAD is going up, and trust in China is going down. So it's going to be a constant game. The defensive line, the point about the defensive line is nobody really knows where it is for either side. And that's why the context matters. That's why trade agreements, strategic dialogue, strong alliances, thinking about regional architecture, all these elements are essential because you don't want to go into this game with China just trying to judge where are you going to fight. Where's the defensive line? And I think the administration is, frankly, going into this with, with, with one hand tied behind its back, particularly on trade. James, can I add just one thing? Please, Bob. Um, you know, uh, to kind of add to the perspective, one of the things that Mike has done nicely here is he's looking at the region as a whole. And now both Kurt and Mike had their specialty in the Asia Pacific or Indo Pacific, and even within that kind of in, in Japan. But I think as you shift to the policy topic, it's really important to recall the United States is a global player. This is one of the topics, in a sense, that the pivot sort of, uh, sort of raised in the overall debate. And one thing this audience might find interesting, Mike and I have discussed separately, is people in Asia right now are watching very closely what the Trump administration does with North America and Mexico. Yeah. Because their own view is if the United States acts so much against our own interest with the economy of Mexico and the politics of Mexico or do their best to elect Lopez Obrador, an anti-American pro-Castro president in 2018, then people in a hard-headed sense in East Asia say, we can't really expect this to work out from our perspective. Um, the Empress of China, which is on the cover, Mike may not even be aware of this, when it sailed to China, it didn't go across the Pacific, it went across the Atlantic and the Indian Ocean. So it's a global game here. And one of the challenges, I think, for, for President Trump going forward is how does he, it, frankly, see the interconnections of these pieces, and in particular, in dealing with China, while you have to look at the Asia Pacific and you have to look at India, you also have to see how this fits in a global posture. It, it is uh, a recurring difficulty in assessing President Trump, I think, for not just for us, but for foreign leaders, yeah. uh, when to ascribe Machiavellian design to him and when to conclude that he's simply acting on impulse. Or just didn't, didn't and, and, get and, a good night's sleep. And, yeah. and, and I'm, I'm not proposing that we will settle that here. Um, <laughs> This next question is a jump ball for anyone who would like to, to weigh in. Um, is there a realistic solution to the North Korean nuclear problem uh, that can be effectuated in the short term, by which I would, I would place it at, let's say, a 10-year interval, that any of you can envision? Well, I, I banged my head against that problem a long time. Bob has. The scars has. are still visible. Um, <laughs> I will embarrass my wife now by telling one quick story. At one point, when I was out of government, this 
years ago changing my son's diapers and he was struggling and fighting back and swinging at me, I said to him, don't mess with me, I've negotiated with North Korea and without losing a beat, Eileen says to another room, how'd that turn out? <laughs> <laughs> um, Today, Xander is the most grown-up person here. <laughs> Uh, that was nine years ago. Um, the, uh, I think there's a broad consensus among people who've struggled with this from over four administrations that we are not going to get a diplomatic outcome that we like. It's just not going to happen. That Kim Jong-un is determined to have ballistic missiles capable of striking the U.S. and nuclear warheads to go on them in addition to the arsenal he already has to strike Japan, South Korea, Guam. Um, that we are not going to preemptively strike North Korea because the consequences are enormous and frightening. Uh, we would do it if we had to. Uh, General Mattis, others, the right to say all options are on the table, but that's not an option we want to choose in all likelihood. So we're looking at second best options, uh, I think, at constraining, limiting, slowing down um, the actual threat to us. And there are concrete things China can do, the things we can do, missile defense, interdictions, uh, secondary sanctions against Chinese firms, for example, that are, you know, helping North Korea get things. But there are things specifically China can do. I, I think a great outcome for U.S.-China relations would be if the Ministry of State Security turned over containers full of missile components to anyone, the IAEA, the CIA, whoever. There are things China could do very concretely. I don't think Beijing is going to pull the plug and end this regime for a whole host of reasons. But there, there are concrete things they could do. I don't think this last summit achieved an agreement on that, but if we know what we, what we need to do, at least in the near term, to defend ourselves, uh, there are things China can do. The, the ultimate resolution to this problem is the end of the Kim regime, in my view. I don't think there's any other way for us to be confident about the end of nuclear weapons, but I also don't see us collapsing the regime Kurt, anytime soon. I, I just have to agree with Mike on this, and you know, I, uh, like Mike, I've worked on a long, a long time. I, I have to say, um, you know, I've said this before, but but I, I really have, and it's remarkable. It's hard to really put a record like this together, but just really an unerring record of failure, um, without really even a glimmer of you know success. I, I mean, the way I try to do it is reformulate the problem. Like we've kept our alliances together. We've essentially taken steps to prevent certain kinds of proliferation. We have, you know, there's been no country that's defected in terms of engagement with North Korea. But I think Mike's general proposition about the longer game is correct. One finds in government that it's deeply unsatisfying. One of the most deeply unsatisfying things to do in government is to sit in a North Korea meeting because they, it is, you know, you, you hear this in government all the time, Kath knows it, the idea of Groundhog Day, where you've had this meeting a thousand times. And usually a new group comes in, thinks to themselves, I'm smarter, I've run an oil company, I've built hotels, all I need to do is just, is just to focus my considerable intellect and, and record of experience and I'll get this done. And then becomes quite clear that you know, the, Korea, North Korea is the land of lousy options. And the best option that we can do right now, frankly, is to put pressure on China. And I would say that I think the one area, the one area of real success beyond, I think, a very good start with Japan, I think uh, President Trump has managed to scare the Chinese uh, on North Korea. And the only other time that that has happened was the, in the immediate aftermath of the Bank of uh, Delta Asia? Or no, it, it really it, it, aftermath of Iraq War when Bob and mm -hmm. Mike were in government and the Chinese were very anxious that the, they were going to extend similar military action in Asia. I, I, think, um, I think they went, they left Mar-a-Lago with just enough uncertainty that, that, that things could happen and so they're not going to talk about it publicly, James, but they're going to put pressure on North Korea. Before we leave this subject, though, Bob, let me, let me sure. pose this follow-up to you. Was North Korea always the land of bad options? Uh, uh, or is it the case that uh, over the last 10 to 15 years, China has simply exalted its fear of instability on the peninsula, its fear of a mass exodus of refugees across the border uh, over and above its non-proliferation concerns? Well, there's a big debate among historians, to actually go back a little bit further, about you know, whether 
as opposed to going near the Yalu as MacArthur did and having the Chinese signal that they were going to come across, that if they had stopped at the narrow part of the waste, you really could have destroyed the rest of the North Korean regime. But that's one of those questions of history um, that Mike touches on a little bit in the book. Um, I, I think the, you know, I tend to believe that most American policymakers operate in a pragmatic fashion. I don't think they're great theorists. I think Mike has talked about some issues of framework of strategy. That's not how most people come to the job. But Kissinger's made a point that is true, which is that you know sometimes the United States gets itself in little trouble thinking that all problems are solvable. Sometimes they're manageable. Yeah. Um, and sometimes, uh, in a way, as Kurt said, you have to kind of reframe it. And where I think the danger is, and it's a way of answering your question, is that I think whether it would have been a Clinton administration or a Trump administration, the tendency would be to go to say, China, you can fix this, you have to fix it. And when the Chinese don't fix it, we'll have more controversy and problems. I think there's things China can do, but China either won't or can't destabilize the regime. It will not run that risk for a lot of reasons we could get into. And so to follow up on Kurt's point, the challenge will be this, is that whether the Trump administration used some of the anxiety and some of the frustrations that China has with North Korea to squeeze North Korea, to weaken it, to put it in a position where internationally, sorry to use the terrible world of multilateralism, but in a multilateral sense, they are more constrained. If you say to China, you know, cut off all supplies, you know, have a coup, overthrow the regime, they're, gonna, they're not going to do that. They were not going to run that risk. But there are a lot of things they could do to make life a lot more difficult and send the signal to Kim Jong-il. So that's a good example, actually, of where kind of having some historic sense about what's been tried before, what will work, what can you logically get the Chinese to do, could allow you to push the Chinese without, if, if you go today to China and to Beijing and say, you solve the problem, let me tell you the first thing the Chinese will say. They say, we need something to work with. Well, you need to restart the six-party talks, yeah. or you need to offer the, the North Koreans a peace treaty, and so on and so forth. If you go to China and you make the point to say, look, we now believe that China not only has a nuclear capability, but ballistic missiles and mobile ballistic missiles that could hit the United States, and we will not accept that to our security, and we're going to take actions with missile defense and other things. And if you want to have an effective working relationship, we have a list of things that will send the signal to the North Koreans. You, I think, have a chance of getting some reasonable results, but not to overthrow the regime. The Kim family, over many years' time now, has apparently learned, I think, that, uh, that uh, there is very little that uh, they can do in the nuclear sphere that is going to cross some red line for the Chinese. And so they've more or less been acting with impunity mm -hmm. in the pursuit of that, that program. Is, is that fair? Well, this all goes to an era whether we believe deterrence has any role in the world and whether there's any role for missile defense. I mean, there were times in the recent past where the United States felt that having nuclear weapons or potential of nuclear weapons means that we should invade countries. Other people have thought, well, maybe that actually, maybe deterrence might have worked a little bit better. So we shouldn't give up on deterrence, but I'm saying not just traditional deterrence in terms of the ability that you could have a nuclear exchange. <coughs> First, the missile defense, and secondly, there are a lot of things that you can do, and Mike touched on some of them, where you could squeeze the regime, you can make it more uncomfortable, you could sort of weaken its own sort of internal position. Maybe, ultimately, you could work with China so you could have a coup that would overthrow the regime and have somebody friendly to China. As Mike knows, when I had some strategic discussions over 10 years ago, I said to the then sort of strategic thinker in the Chinese system, look, we'd be happy if North Korea looked like China. How can you disagree with that? Right? So maybe that's on the table. <laughs> the, the Chinese lead in the six party talks at one point demonstrated or at least suggested to the North Koreans that there is not an endless limit uh, or boundless appetite for North Korean provocations because the North Koreans were being particularly threatening to everyone. And the Wu Dawei, the head of the Chinese delegation, uh, wrapped up the session by saying, you know, there's a story in China, an ancient story of a tiger on a mountain that was roaring and there were a hundred donkeys. And the donkeys ran and round and round in circles and they were terrified. And then one of them said, hey, there are a hundred of us. And they killed the tiger. This meeting's over. <laughs> <laughs> so I, 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 it's very unlikely China's going to solve this problem for us. But 
North Korea could push them far enough yeah. uh, but the or other could thing collapse is in this, ways In this discussion, we didn't mention South Korea. Well, you're going to have an election in South Korea. And by the way, that brings us right back to the whole alliance relationship. Because if at the same time we're sending a signal to the South Koreans, either we don't trust the alliance or our economic relationship is in the tank and so on and so forth, you're going to have an effect on the key player on the peninsula. And, and your intelligence collection about this very tough target of North Korea as well, right? The South Korea. I've always wondered exactly what the South Koreans get versus what we get. Maybe they know better. <laughs> right. That's for the closed session. I do know that we want to save some time for questions from the audience, uh, but I want to pose one last question to our panel uh, before we do that. And um, once, uh, by the way, the question time is here, uh, there's folks who are running around with microphones. If you just wait till the microphone reaches you and you tell us uh, your name and identify yourself and uh, I guess your affiliation We'll be, I know the panelists will be grateful to take your questions. Final question from your humble moderator. Um, uh, who would each of you identify as the greatest strategic thinker that the United States has produced on Asia uh, at any point in our history? Well, Bob Zellick and Kurt Campbell. <laughs> I should. <laughs> um, <laughs> certainly in the top, top 20. <laughs> This, is, this reflects a deficiency on the part of the moderator not to have said present company excluded. Yeah. Well, um, I, uh, John Quincy Adams is phenomenal. My friend, our friend Charlie Adele has a, one, a wonderful biography on Char John Quincy Adams as a strategist. He served as ambassador in I think eight European courts and really played the European balance of power game, but based on American sort of Republican, small r, Republican principles. But the one who impressed me the most, and I interviewed him for an hour in his apartment overlooking um, San Francisco Bay was George Schultz, is George Schultz, who was a Marine in the Pacific, came out of it, he told me, with no animosity towards Japan. Um, Bob would have known him well in government, stood for our alliances, stood for free trade, human rights and democracy, nudged and pushed for Taiwan, the Philippines, and Korea to move towards more democratic governments, <clears throat> um, and did all that and maintained a very respectful dialogue with Beijing um, kind of the full set. Uh, remarkable, remarkable uh, former Marine and, and diplomat. And, polymath, uh, really. And a polymath and an economist. He came yeah. at it from economics and as a student of history. Um, I'm really glad that Mike uh, has helped revive William Seward's <laughs> reputation. I mean, most of us now know William Seward from uh, a gang of rivals uh, or team of team rivals. Of rivals. Team of rivals. Um, and or they know if they're in Alaska that he's the man that bought Alaska. Um, Mike touches on this, and you can even take it further. When I talked about the importance of North America with the Asia Pacific, um, in the 1850s, Seward at one point says, this is after the Mexican War, look, at some point there'll have to be some form of union between among Canada, the United States, and Mexico, but it has to be voluntary. It has to be brought in self-interest. He basically sort of anticipates uh, 100 years later. Um, in addition to buying Alaska, um, he wanted to buy British Columbia. Um, he wanted to buy the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, so that was later uh, acquired. He actually goes on to uh, try to get a uh, uh, access across uh, in Central America it's either Panama or Nicaragua, so as to get the canal, so he predates uh, Teddy Roosevelt by about 50 years. But one, the, the thing that's in his thinking that's most important, and Mike kind of touched on this, and it relates to whether it's called sort of governance or values or others. You remember, his main purpose in life was to preserve the union. That was the definition of his life. And we sort of forget that, you know, for that generation, the idea of an expanding republic and being able to preserve a large republic, this was the last best hope of mankind, according to Lincoln. But they took that idea of union, confederation, how republics can work together, and they started to apply it to their international thinking. It's very different than a Kissingerian or a Wilsonian or other thinking. In some ways, some of the types of things that Mike has talked about in this book, and that I think will actually infuse US policy if it gets back on the right track, go back to that sort of notion of people who kind of take the American experience that no one thought would have worked and actually say, how can we adapt this to a larger international structure? So that's order. Seward. That's mm -hmm. Seward for you. Kurt. So James, thanks. And I like, I like both answers. Um, 
Also, uh, Joel, Schwartz, Joel Schwartz has left us with a, a biting metaphor, the gardening metaphor, which is the one that most people use when they're talking admirably, admiringly about American strategy, the idea of the gardener who's out you know, diligently tending to the beds. Um, the, the other, I just will say, the other thing, I, James, I really like about this book, and, and, and I, Stanley was here, but he's no longer, but the, the thing that's great about reading it is that those of you know, if you're an assistant secretary in Washington, you're just about at the right level to get someone a cup of coffee, right? Just <laughs> you may be a little lacking in, in rank, but right, right there. But this book is, you know, not all of us worked at the level of, of, of Bob. This, this book has a lot of great stuff from assistant secretaries, and so you can't help but sit up a little taller when you read it. For, for, for me, I, I take a very different view. For, for me, I, I think the emblematic strategist of, of, of Asia uh, is actually George Marshall. And um, I, I do that because I think Asia, fundamentally for the United States, has been a humbling experience, basically. Basic, even in the midst of a larger reputation of success. And so what's great about Marshall is this unbelievable, unvarnished experience as um, you know, viceroy and you know, uber military strategist, counselor to presidents during the Second World War. And then immediately thereafter is dispatched to try to negotiate the peace between the nationalists and uh, the communists. And if you read Dan Kurzweilin's great new book on you know, the China mission, 45 to 47, every possible mistake that Americans has, have made in Asia were, was made during that period. All well-meaning, all tremendously you know, based in strategy, but ultimately um, to no avail. And so I've got to nominate uh, Marshall, uh, James, for my you know, contribution. You're, just one last cloud on this is that it's a good way of bringing it back to one of the points that Mike made in the book about Europe and Asia. People often don't connect the two, but remember, Marshall goes out to Asia or to China almost for a year, yeah. mm -hmm. and and then he makes, in my view, a very politically courageous decision. He decides that there would have been some people that said pour more money in, do various types of things, and there's a debate about whether that would have helped the nationalists or not. He says no. He says let's not do it. But a year or two later, he makes the very bold decision for Europe that he says to, to make Europe survive, we have to come up with what became the Marshall Plan, which was an economic basis that then later was based on security and alliances. So in that critical period, people often don't connect those two. But you have I, a political decision about Asia and one about Europe. I, I will say, having just finished this book, Bob, the thing that's fascinating about it is that we tend to look back on these periods as you know, kind of you know, you know, halcyon, golden, you know, but in fact, Marshall wanted to give money to China, but after consultations with the Hill, questions about his own role in Pearl Harbor, he came to the conclusion that under no circumstances could he get, you know, uh, several billion dollars through Congress. And so he went to uh, Truman and said, I'd love to do it, I can't get it done. Well, so this has been a fascinating discussion thus far of this book by More Than Providence. And we're not done because we want to hear from, from you folks. Uh, we'll take the first question from this lady right here on the, uh, on the edge of the aisle there. Please just tell us your name and uh, your affiliation. Hi, thank you for a really um, thorough, deep discussion. My name is Rachel Oswald. I'm a reporter with Congressional Quarterly. My question for the panel is about signaling. Um, in your discussions with um, Asian partners, how have the messages that um, cabinet officials like Secretaries Tillerson and Mattis, as well as Mike Pence, how well have what they've been doing to send a reassuring constant message, how has that alleviated some of the contradictory signals that we saw from candidate Trump, transition Trump, and now President Trump? Basically, who does Asia think speaks for U.S. policy? Some people in the U.S. say, well, Trump is an old man just yelling at the television. Maybe they don't say that any much, as much after the Syria strike, but you know, we in the U.S. may have a different perception of what Trump says and means than the rest of the world. Um, did everyone hear the question, first of all? Everyone, did everyone hear the question? Okay. Mike. Everyone heard it? Yes. Yeah. Um, it was about signaling and what signals are the cabinet members sending. I mean, as a candidate and even into the early uh, weeks of his administration, Donald Trump said things that, it's like he read my book and the five things you're not supposed to do 
that's what he decided to do. Um, he said, for example, that we would only defend allies if they paid more. And he didn't care, I'm paraphrasing, if that meant Japan went nuclear. Um, he said that he didn't necessarily think he had to stick with our one China policy. So he went right at the most fundamental pillars of those two countries' relationships with the US, which is probably how he went about negotiations in his company uh, with a bank or whoever. Go at the most sacred thing the other guy wants, tell him it's on the table, and you're gonna have to earn it back. Um, he reversed in both cases, and I think the signaling of the cabinet secretaries was probably important. Secretary Mattis went to Japan before Abe came here and said, Japan is a model host for our troops. We unequivocally stand by our commitment to defend Japan, including in the Senkakus, which is, which is, um, which is uh, China also claims it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sort of the litmus test of American commitment. Um, and then Secretary Tillerson, in a quieter, quieter way, did that on the one China policy. I'm not sure, but my sense is these cabinet secretaries have, in a way, if not boxed in the president, perhaps in cahoots with people in the NSC who know what they're doing, pre-scripted, to some extent, the president's engagements with Prime Minister Abe and President Xi Jinping. So the signaling is important, I think. Next question. Sir. My name is Ben Lawson. I'm a Navy Asia strategist at the Pentagon. This question is for Mr. Green. Uh, thank you, sir, for the, for the book. Just with respect to the scholarship you've done on the last 230 years, I'd just like to ask about the last five. And uh, how would you assess the Obama administration's policy in the South China Sea you know, with respect to China's actions over the last five years? Did everyone hear the question? OK. Kurt. <laughs> um, so, you will have 30 seconds yeah, after this, no, Kurt. Pre President Obama, um, <laughs> Theodore Roosevelt came the closest to saying that Asia's uh, core region for us. He put it on, <coughs> up towards the Caribbean and the Atlantic. But President Obama was the first president to really make Asia, with the pivot, um, a, a top priority, coinciding with economic reality and the fact that, you know, on his watch, as he became president, the polls showed that over half of Americans agreed Asia's the most important region. And I think he continued um, strategies uh, towards China and Japan and Asia, begun by Clinton, expanded by Bush, um, and that was basically since Nixon we engaged China after the Cold War as China threw its weight around in the middle of the Clinton administration, we balanced, as Joe and I puts it, with Japan. Bush continued the engagement with China. I was hired to do Japan initially, expanded India. And I think the Obama administration's biggest success was in Southeast Asia, which was suddenly the, the line. Um, and, and, and commitment to an ASEAN summit, the East Asia summit, and a lot of diplomacy. And I think that's probably gonna be his, his best legacy if people can be smart enough to, to follow it. Where he had the most trouble, in my view, was, um, in translating his campaign theme into a strategy. His campaign theme basically was you've got war, Iraq, Bush, Hillary Clinton, or you've got engagement with, you know. And that's a fine campaign theme, but the reality is there's a vast world in between of, 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 of what's called the gray zone, hybrid warfare, uh, testing of wills, which is not war and it's not peace, it's what we see in the South China Sea. And I think that he and his administration struggled with that. I think Secretary Clinton was, as Kurt suggested earlier, I think she recognized this, but I think there were others in the administration who wanted to take, as Kurt put it, the longer view, not get tied down in these issues. I think in retrospect, um, in this little internecine fight, um, Secretary Clinton was probably on the right side of the issue, given what we've seen, but you know, it's, it's so debated. I, I happen to have handy. Kurt Campbell's most recent book called The Pivot. Yeah, yeah order now, they're going quick. Uh, and, <laughs> I, I've, I've published three books and I like to tell people, yes, you can get that book for about a dollar on eBay now. Yeah. Um, yeah. These, are, these are in a different category, of course. Yeah. This is called The Pivot, The Future of American Statecraft in Asia, and Kurt's book serves as a memoir of his time, I think, with Secretary Clinton, uh, uh, but also, as he frames it, is very much a book about the future. Uh, and, but this title ref uh, refers to the effort under President Obama, uh, very early on in his term, uh, to, to uh, shift, uh, not entirely, but to an important degree, American foreign policy focus and initiative to this extraordinarily important region, and perhaps away, to some extent, from the Middle East.
Uh, and this obliges us to note, as we were talking about uh, in the holding room before this event, that a man named Bilahari Kasakan, a former senior official in Singapore's foreign ministry, has an article in the May-June current edition of The American Interest, uh, in which he writes, Kurt, the metaphor of a pivot or rebalance gives the wrong impression, since what pivots or rebalances one way could easily swing another. This evokes the very image of an inconstant United States that China continually propounds. So, would you like to use this forum now to pivot yeah. away from the metaphor of the pivot? So, uh, so government primarily is about rolling out initiatives that immediately disappear. Uh, <laughs> and, and you point to them and people are like, what, what? And you know, this, 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 I just did this. We did this. Um, very rarely do you do something that then becomes bigger than you anticipate and you have to deal with the unintended consequences of that. And I, I would say, generally speaking, I think the way particularly me and others tried to articulate the idea of spending more time on Asia, as James very graciously put it, did not play well and was not particularly effective public diplomacy. I think it, it led, your, the, the biggest concern I had at now historically is I think it sent the wrong message to Europe, the idea that we would pivot away from Europe. Um, everything the United States has ever done of significance or consequence, we've done with Europe. And so the whole idea was to try to do more with Europe in Asia. Uh, I would stand by the argument that we are overinvested in the Middle East and that some strategic uh, rebalancing is necessary, but it has to be done in a way that doesn't lead for us to cut and run uh, from the Middle East more generally. But I'm afraid that in the, in the layout of the policy, probably the unintended consequences outweighed the, some of the good in the policy more generally. And at the same time, to the gentleman's question about the South China Sea, I'm, I, I am still struck, I, anyone who thinks that we're spending enough time in Asia uh, is just not paying attention. So, I mean, we, we have historically, I would disagree with the president, I think we had a historically strong position in Asia, but what used to be effective is no longer effective. Can I? What used to be successful in terms of being a strong player in Asia, the, the price of entry has gone up dramatically, and that's not just militarily, that's diplomatically, that's economically, commercially, trade-wise that Bob, it, it calls for an integrated strategy that, that really is the, um, at the core of what grand strategy is. And we do not have that. And we did not have that in the Bush administration, we did not have that in the Clinton administration, and we did not have that in the Obama administration. And the hope was that as this reality of the Asian century would be dawning on us, that there would be an understanding that you need a multilateral dimension, enhanced you know, focus on allies, more work with India, a more uh, you know, concentrated engagement on China, but an understanding that you need a relationship, a military dimension, and a trade dimension. Um, that was the hope, that was the argument that was put forward in the book. I, I, I am, um, I'm not confident that we're gonna be able to do that going forward. I, I think several of the key pieces are missing, and the most important piece is not the military piece. And the fact that Bob and Mike, I think, accurately put forward our history is that we are a maritime, maritime uh, player. Militarily, our investments in the last 20 years have almost ex you know, been dramatically in ground forces, special forces, and uh, operations in the desert or mountainous areas. We have not made the kinds of investments militarily or strategically that will serve us well in Asia uh, for the next uh, 30 to 40 years, and they are on our horizon. So we've got to do trade, military, diplomacy, all those elements that will be necessary for an effective... Not to mention cyber, by the way. Mike. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, um, as, as Kurt mentioned in this book, one of the things you find, it's a little scary, but because leadership attention to age is episodic, assistant secretaries matter a lot. And, and Kurt, 
mattered a lot. I remember when Kurt was nominated for the job I was in Asia, and I had um, dinner with a diplomat who was going to go work for him in Washington, and she, she didn't know you, and she said, uh, I hear Campbell's a strategy guy. And, this, and, and it definitely had a negative connotation, yeah. but Kurt was definitely a strategy guy, and it mattered. Um, I came out of my research and book writing experience and working in the White House with an appreciation of what Henry Kissinger said, which is you've got to get the concept right. It's not realistic for Asia experts to expect the president to pay attention to Asia all the time. Um, we had, I don't know, probably 50 more meetings in the Situation Room than we had on Asia uh, on Iraq. And, but we, I think we generally knew what we were trying to do in Asia. And, um, the reality is we are going to be pulled into the Middle East. We are going to have to deal with Russia. Um, that the international system now is um, under, under pressure from states like Russia, like China, that in different ways are challenging the status quo. Um, and we've got to get the concept right. We have to understand you can't have people going into the situation room saying, now, which one is the South China Sea and which one? I mean, more than ever before, we need people going into. Is that your understanding of what's happening presently? I don't know. Okay, but right, I just want to make that clear. Well, starting out, you know, the difference between the Paracels and the Spratlings would be a good starting point. It, it, can I, can it, I touch it, it worries me a bit. What, I just, uh, what doesn't yeah. worry me is, just really quickly, the generation, and I say this as a professor, the generation coming up uh, is very, very strong in the United States in understanding the region in multiple yes. dimensions. But we are in, in part because of the wars of the Middle East, part because we're transitioning out of a Eurocentric academic and cultural history, it's much easier to, I mean, Spanish, German, French in high schools far uh, uh, overwhelm Chinese or Japanese. We're coming out of that. Um, we're going to be in a little bit of a leadership gap, I fear, for a number of years. But the generation coming up is it's unbelievable. A powerful unbelievable. point, James. Very powerful yeah. point. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned yeah. cyber, and I want to come back to that uh, because one of the interesting little observations that Mike makes in the book, and I think one of the values of it is not only the historical piece, but constantly linking it to a policymaker's perspective, was the, the Washington Naval Arms Control Treaties and the effect that it had on technology and doctrinal development, this about aircraft carriers, but also the marine expeditionary capabilities, I would add actually submarines. Yeah. And that's quite relevant to your point about the South China Sea and also to sort of Kurt's point about sort of investment. You know, one of the things that when you think about what is consistent over time is the geography of the region. And obviously the distance that the United States has and some relative powers. But some of that can be adjusted with technology. You mentioned cyber, you could talk about outer space. And I think one of the big challenges that actually, in a way, from a historical perspective that Mike tees up here is kind of, what are some of the technological dimensions that we have to be considering today when you're dealing with anti-access area denial, what's the nature of kind of your undersea capacities? There's a whole critical area right now that the Defense Department needs to be investing yeah. in, not for the challenges of today or the next year, but frankly, 10 years out. Let's, let's look to the audience for, uh, do we have time for two more questions, do we know? Uh, we'll do two more questions. This gentleman right here. Mike, Wait for the microphone, please. Uh, Bernard Gordon, uh, University of New Hampshire. Mike, first of all, congratulations. Um, your main theme of no, uh, no single nation dominance, uh, or in other words, unfortunately, I think there is a view growing up uh, illustrated by the Australian scholar Hugh White, who continues to stress that the American goal has been primacy. My, I want to ask you, do you think that there is a, a, a difference there? I, do, I suspect there is. And do you think that is a difference that makes a difference? Because that Australian view, I think, is beginning to grow. Uh, uh, so, th 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 I shouldn't say this with five cameras here, but the final exam question for my class on Asia strategy is, is the ultimate U.S. objective in Asia primacy? Because for most of this history, it was not. For most of this history, it was, it was not managing a unipolar system where we were dominant, or a bipolar system. For most of this history, it was managing a multipolar system where we understood, despite ourselves, how to manage balance of power. I think over the next 50 years, Asia is not returning to a Sinocentric system. It's, it's moving towards a multipolar system in which China may be a pretty big and powerful and important pole, but let's not forget India. 
or Indonesia or Korea or Japan. And if, if you look at the surveys, if you look at the, um, the, the, um, the nature of the regime types and all the rest of it, they don't want to live in a Chinese-dominated Asia. So that doesn't mean we can contain China. We can't. I don't think anybody's signing up for that. But it means we do have a, a, a hand we can play that we've played before in our history pretty effectively. And it means respecting and listening to those countries. Um, the worst thing we could do, in my view, is embrace this idea of a new model of great power relations that the Chinese are proposing that the US and China should sort of determine the future of Asia. We have a much stronger hand than that. Doesn't mean we contain or disrespect China, but there's a, there's a lot more to Asia than China. And in that, I think, if we're subtle and smart about it, we, we have a good hand to play. Last question. Um, yes, the gentleman way in the back there. Thank you very much. I'm Ben Self from the Maureen and Mike Mansfield Foundation, a very old student of Mike's. Um, Mike, you taught me that the US-Japan alliance was so important. It was like the Holy Grail. And that's what the Mansfield Foundation continues to work on. But I worried that when you're thinking about US strategy, that might become the, the cart before the horse. In other words, that it might seem like a goal in and of itself as opposed to a component or a tool for advancing US interests. And I'm curious how you dealt with your own baggage as you confronted that issue. You come in here. Uh, we saved the best for last. Thank you. Month. Thank you, Ben. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ben. What did I give you at Slice? <laughs> um, so I came into this project knowing that I'm trained originally as a Japan guy and then studied Korean, and that that would be the context. Um, I'd worked in government, in the NSC, uh, worked in the Bush administration, expected that would make this interesting. <laughs> um, uh, and so I, um, uh, I did dozens and dozens of interviews, uh, including with China experts and, and people who are still alive who've been involved in the formation of the strategy. And I tried to present um, our strategic uh, position in Asia, not as uh, perennially Japan first, but as this among other things, this, this tension where this is a, a region that historically is Sinocentric, where Japan is the maritime power, and the answer to this is not to you know, double down on Japan and, and isolate uh, or contain China, which some people in this town argue, but that at the end of the day, um, we will be in a stronger position to engage China and have a more productive relationship if there's no doubt in the Chinese leaders' minds about our commitment to our alliances with fellow democratic countries. So to me, the US-Japan alliance uh, is not the end. It's the, it's the means to an end, and that end is, a, is a, an Asia that's open, stable, uh, in the, steadily more just. Um, and um, it's therefore, I think even, you know, uh, most China hands, had they, had they written this book, would have come out in more or less the same place. That to get China right, you gotta first get your allies right, and then you're in a much stronger position to work with Beijing from a position of confidence. Um, so. can I, can I, I, I do think, I, I see a change when Mike is talking about the generation and how they've changed. Um, this is the area, and I, I actually credit Mike enormously for helping in this process. I think he is generally right that the strategic approach increasingly is going to be the, the, for America, for the United States to be effective in Asia, you need a comprehensive approach, not only engagement with China, but a strong relationship with your allies. And I think in the past, there had been a tendency among those in particular, two things. One, those who were focused on China to be really just focused on China. And if anything, to be somewhat dismissive sometimes, or even condescending about the alliance issues. And the alliance guys would be very focused on where those palm trees were in Okinawa, and that was the big issue, you know, how to make sure we pl replant them and, you know, what kind of concrete we use on the runway and things like that. And these two groups really didn't interact very much. And in fact, at the strategic level, although they could, they could work together because there was overlapping circles, there were areas of tension. I think increasingly, those are going to diminish. And I think most of the China folks understand that you can't get it done with China without more help around the table. And most of the 
the strategy guys who work on alliances understand that understanding China and wanting a workable relationship with China is essential for an effective Asia strategy. And that's a big difference from the 70s and 80s in which, you know, maybe different views in both camps. Would you agree with that? I think that's right. I think that's right. You know, when I covered uh, the State Department for Fox News, uh, I had someone say to me once in this exact context of covering uh, East Asian Pacific affairs, uh, that one thing that our interlocutors across the other side of the table, whether it's uh, the Chinese or the North Koreans, like to say to the Americans is, you have the watch, but we have the time, uh, <laughs> which speaks to strategic patience. Um, this hasn't always been, I have to confess, the most flattering portrayal of government service at high levels that we've heard from the three of you. <laughs> but I know I speak for everyone in this room and beyond when I say how grateful we are to all three of you for your government service and to your sh for your sharing your views with us today. The name of the book is By More Than Providence, Grand Strategy and American <coughs> Power in the Asian Pacific since 1783. It is published by Columbia University Press. It is a majestic study, and of course, it makes a great gift. It, Thank it, you all it, most for- important, Most important, it's available for sale outside. Uh, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Thank you all Thanks. very much.